Jan, a tuba player, and um, uh, we're in his home, and uh, it's on September 3rd, uh, 2003. Uh, Lenny's from uh, St. Cloud, Minnesota, and uh, came in the Navy in, in about 1941, but he's going to talk us through uh, some uh, situations that existed at that time that led him and uh, his brother before him to, to come in the Navy, and we'll see what happens from here. You got it, Lenny. Okay, well, I, I I knew about the Navy music through my older brother, Herb, who, who joined, I think, in 1936 and went to the Navy School of Music. And uh, I really had, to, at that time, uh, well, I graduated from high school in 1937, so I was still in high school when, when Herb joined the Navy. So, uh, in, in, in uh, 19, I guess it was 1940, when England declared war on Germany, uh, and they started the draft in this country. At the time, I was I, I was not eligible for the draft yet. I wasn't 21, but I would have had to register for the next one. So I uh, I put in an application for the Navy School of Music. I, I knew knew about it through her, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so I I uh, didn't expect to hear from her so soon. But I but I did, and uh, so uh, I I went. I, Enlisted in the Navy, took an audition at the Navy School of Music. <laughs> I remember the, the man who auditioned me was me. And uh, uh, <laughs> I still remember the music he put in front of me was a, was quite easy. A uh, uh, couple of Susan Marches and things like that. They were, for, they were duck soup. So, so anyway, uh, after in the, in the Navy, after I'd been there for six months, by the time it was December 41, the Japs hit Pearl Harbor, and uh, we were, I was under band 26, our, our chief was Henry Jensen, and uh, we shipped out, I think in April, of, uh, of, of uh, shortly after, a couple of months after the attack at Pearl Harbor, and we were assigned to the USS Northampton. At the time, we didn't know where it was, we had no idea. We knew we were going to the Northampton, and that's all we knew. So we didn't know if it was in the Atlantic or in the Pacific. So they sent us uh, first to uh, Destroyer Base in San Diego. And we were, we were there uh, at the time. It was all blacked out. I mean, they were still expect, expecting possible at, uh, attacks in the San Diego. The, the whole coast there was blacked out. And uh, from there, they sent us to San Francisco, to Treasure Island. And uh, we finally left on a transport from there. Uh, the old Navy, in fact, I think I think it still ex even existed in 1941. The old transport, the USS Henderson. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we got out to Pearl Harbor. And as we were pulling in, of course, the, the on the on the transport we were on, there must have been a thousand workmen going out to uh, yard workmen, civilians going to help clean up the mess in Pearl Harbor. There were ships bottoms up and it was a big mess. And as we were pulling in there, I could see on the, on the fan tail of one ship on the back end, Northampton, the big letters. So we knew that uh, we were going aboard ship and we, we didn't know where, what was, uh, was in store for us. So to make a long story short, we relieved the band that had been on the Northampton for about three years, mostly in peacetime, and they were they were so happy to see us because they knew that they could go back. They were going back to the states for uh, for shore duty, and I think they went. Uh, they they got duty. I think somewhere. Uh, I don't know some naval air station in Georgia. I think. Uh, so anyway, we were only on the Northampton for about six months. First of all, we were we were with the carrier Wasp when it was sunk. And then before you before you get into your time on the Northampton, talk me back to when you went into music and got into tuba playing and, and all the stuff, because both you and her both played tuba, right? Yes, we both uh, played tuba and string bass, too. Yeah. Was yeah. Well, you guys started as kids? and We started as kids. In my hometown of St. Cloud, Minnesota, it was unusual. At that time, the population was about 25,000, but it was unusual in that they had a full-time band leader paid by the city and he usually had what they called a beginner's band and a junior band and a senior band. He's pretty and, well organized. Yeah, so. and uh, Herb had been through that band and everything. And uh, that old band leader, his name was G. Oliver Riggs, and he was a uh, he was an old martinet. 
but uh, he got results. Anyway, that's how we started out in, 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 in that band. Mm -hmm. And uh, Herb, so, Herb was doing a lot of dance work, and so was I later on then. So when you so when you joined the Navy and uh, went down to the school, they, they gave you your transportation and all that stuff, and you yes. got to the Navy Yard there. Uh, it could give me some sense of what the school was like during your daily business there at the school. I know that uh, guys out of the Navy band, I believe, uh, were your instructors, and it was during their off hours that they came to instruct you. Yeah. Right? When, yes, when I when uh, when I got there, it was uh, by this time it was early. It was July in 1941, and I believe the Navy band at the time was up in Toronto at the, uh, the Canadian National Exhibition. And a lot of the Navy band members who didn't make that trip were there as instructors and so on. And uh, uh, I, can, I can still remember, uh, uh, that's where I first met Frank Simonelli. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, our, our, our barracks was what is, uh, was the receiving station, which is now, it was, we had just a third, I just think it was just a second or third deck uh, below us, was, it was all fire control, but that was our, that's our barracks, and uh, what is now the Austers Club is where, where we had all our rehearsals. Then there was what they call the Navy Ax, uh, Annex, a little old, little old fashioned building there to, for the little scuttlebutts, the drinking fountain. Man had to put a block of ice in there every day to get cold water, <laughs> and uh, so we would we would rehearse uh, with various uh, leaders, inc including Thurman. Excuse me. Yeah. All righty. The the routine at the at the school at the time was we were we we had various various classes, uh, harmony and solfege and a few things like that. Mostly uh, Navy band members were instructors, and. Uh, we uh, rehearsed with, with different different conductors, and then when we were finally uh, assigned to a certain band, we were band 26, and we were assigned, at, he was first musician at the time. At that time, uh, a first class musician just had a little music lie on his arm, yeah. but the first musician had the first class crow. He was the first one that had a crow. Anyway, our, we, were, we were assigned to, uh, to Henry Jensen, and we rehearsed there, and then, of course, the, then the Japs hit Pearl Harbor, and uh, I think, I think it was April, a couple of months after, uh, when we had to go to California, to uh, we went first to the uh, destroyer base, and then to San Francisco. From there, uh, to Pearl Harbor. The minute we got aboard the ship, the Northampton, yeah, our chief Jensen was still first musician. And of course, he knew that uh, that band, that billet on the Northampton, raided a chief. And I believe the chief who had been aboard there, they, those, that band had been on there for about three years, mostly in peacetime. I think his name was Glover, G L O V E R. And Glover said to, to Jensen, uh, I'm going to have to give you an examination for chief. And he says, uh, What, Jensen, what instrument did you play? And Jensen said, Trumpet. He said, "How many valves did it have?" He said, three. You're okay. You're you're chief." <laughs> and Jensen had already had bought his chief's clothes before he left the states. So he be, he became an instant chief when we went aboard the ship. And then the other band that was leaving for for a day or so, they had to show us the uh, the very watches that they stood, and then yeah. then they went back to the states. They were a happy bunch of guys. I guess so. They've been <laughs> on there for three years or something yeah. like that. So then on the Northampton. Uh, we uh, we were on, in September the fifteenth or sixteenth, nineteen forty-two. We were with the carrier Wasp, in operating in that task force, and and, and a Jap submarine got it, and uh, I stood there and watched it. It wasn't that far from us, burning from from head to toe, and and it's uh, of course it they couldn't save it and it sank and then that was now in and now October the 26th 1942 we were with the Hornet when it was sunk okay. and we tried to horn it we tr it was listing and dead in the water listing way over burning fiercely and we tried we were assigned to try to tow it they had this huge cable rigged them on 
rigged on it, so we just got going on it about maybe two knots. It's barely going, then a whole bunch more draft, draft planes came over, mm -hmm. and uh, they had to let loose. So after that attack was over, we, we hooked up again, and then the cable broke. And then by this time, <coughs> it was actually getting later in the evening. It was still daylight, but there was one of these big four-motor Japanese, I think we call it a Kawanishi bomber, just on the, on the, you could just, just barely visible in the distance, but we knew that she knew where we were and was radioing our position, but it was too far for our guns to shoot it down or anything, and uh, well, to make a long story short, the way they finally decided we had to get out of there, and, and they sent our, a couple of our destroyers over to the Hornet to put it out of its misery, and the, the tor torpedoes over the dam, they'd hit and make a thud, and they didn't do anything, and it was still getting later and later, and finally, they uh, they got real close and were pouring five-inch gunfire into it. Then we left, and it's a good thing we did. Now I didn't know this until after the war, but when we left, there was a huge Jap task force bearing down on us, including battleships, and they came across the burning horn. It was still afloat at two o'clock in the morning, and they at first considered trying to tow it and save it, you know, for themselves. Yeah. And they finally gave up on it. and They put it out of its misery. Now, that was, the torpedoes from the Northampton, what were it, Duds? The, no, there was, well, no, Northampton didn't have torpedoes. The, our destroyers. Oh, the destroyers. The destroyers in our task force. Yeah. They sent, I think, two of them. Uh -huh. And uh, the destroyers, some of them would, would bro brooch or breach out of the water. And yeah. Some of them hit and make a thud and didn't explode. They were terrible. Interesting. And uh, uh, so anyway, it's a good thing we did get out of there because that big, by the, oh, the Enterprise on that day was hit. But it wasn't sunk. But uh, our flyers, any flyers, didn't have their carrier to land on. They could they, they could land on on the, uh, Henderson Field on Guadalcanal. Yeah. So anyway, that was October '42. Now the next month, November, November the th night of November the 30th, this big Jap the Jap task force coming down the slot to reinforce their troops on the island, and we were sent in to break it up. And of course, they broke us up. Now. We, we had radar and the Japs didn't. We had every advantage. We should have murdered them. Instead, they, they, they clobbered us. They sank us. They blew the bow off the Minneapolis, the, the New Orleans, and badly hit the, uh, the uh, heavy cruiser Pensacola. Now, although we were the only ones sunk, I think some of them lost more men killed than we did even. And some of them were out of, out of, out of action for probably a year or so. Now, the band on the Northampton, uh, you were involved in, what kind of watches were you involved with? Well, my watch on the Northampton, my battle station, was, was in the sick bay, stretcher bear. Okay. Uh, during, uh, uh, during the day, it was, I was a lookout mm -hmm. up on the foremast, up, mm -hmm. way up high there. Mm -hmm. And now when, at night, when you couldn't see from up there, then they, they put some of us on, they had these huge uh, searchlights. And we, we, we were on the searchlight. And where we, the one we were on, were right behind the set number two stack on the ship, and these damn fumes from the stack were coming right on. And we, we if we had a, a night watcher, I think we'd we'd, we'd spend the whole night there. Uh, uh, eight, I think eight hours. In the morning, we'd come down from there, from all that suit and crap. We were just black, <laughs> just all that crap all over. We could hardly breathe. So, so anyway, then the, then the next one, of course, we got we got sunk. And uh, we we uh, <laughs> we thought we were going to get sure duty like hell. When we finally did get back to the states, our new orders read: "You will you will proceed to the Navy Yard, Philadelphia, for duty aboard the USS New Jersey." So I put her put the USS New Jersey in commission. She was built there. So after shakedown cruise and whatnot. Uh, right back out through the Panama Canal on the New Jersey and right back out into the Pacific again. So this is the same band, same, same band? band same band, same band, band 26, yeah, we're all together. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in, the, in the Pacific, uh, I got orders, not the whole band, but I got orders. We had just retaken the Philippines. And I got orders to report to Washington, D.C. to the U.S. Navy Band. They had a, they had a vacancy. Old oh, Herbie Spencer, one of the old timers in the Navy Band, uh, he lost all his teeth or something, and uh, they, there was a vacancy, and they, they sent they sent for me. Uh -huh. So I got I got home. 
I think I, 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 I reported to the Navy band in January 1945, <coughs> just a, a few months before the end of the war, to the Navy band. Mm -hmm. And I was skinny as hell. I got to look through a keyhole with both eyes, I think. But uh, uh, And they put me right on the first stand of the, uh, in, the, in the tuba section. And here I hadn't, hadn't been playing at all, hardly. And they put me on the first stand with Phil Cadway. He was a fine tuba player. He had been in the, uh, the National Symphony. So, uh, so I stayed in the Navy band for the next 20 years. <laughs> so that was, that, that was the story. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a, that's a very interesting story. Now, I know that after you got out, you were, you were involved with the films down there for a while. Well, yeah, after the, uh, well, after, the, after the Navy, when I retired from the Navy, for a couple of years, I went, I, I, was, I went to a place called the Research Analysis Corporation. I had, I had to have about every clearance you could possibly think of, high, highly secret ones, and I had, uh, I was a courier. I had a driver to drive us around. Uh, usually we had to make a, make a trip to the Pentagon every morning and every afternoon. And so I, after about two years there, uh, well, Dutch and, and Ralph Eshelman called me said there was a vacancy at the Naval Photo Center there. Yeah. So I, uh, I I joined them at the Naval Photo Center and uh, became an editor of a music and sound effects editor and so on there. Now, and I uh, stayed there now until, until 84. And at 84, I retired for, for good. And I've been retired ever since. Yeah. Now talk to me back through the, the Navy, the experience in the Navy band. Uh, you got there... Brentler had the band then, or Benter still had No, no. Oh, oh, I, I, I did have some experience with Benter, but, but that's while I was still in the music school. Okay. I don't know if I told you about that. Well, well, when I was in the music school, I had, I had just gotten there from boot camp, and there was the, the Navy band symphony was going full full speed then, and they had you know they had all these high powered fiddle fiddle players from New York and everything, Oscar Shumsky and Greenhouse and the cello, big. Big, and uh, they were very busy with the symphony. Of course, Benter was still there. So they were sending me over to play tuba in the symphony. And here I was a scared kid, you know. And, and, and uh, <coughs> one time we were, we were playing uh, Petrushka. Uh, was it was that uh, the Russian composer? Uh, Petrushka. Anyway, there's one part where there's a tuba and clarinet duet. The tuba in the, in the, in the, in the ballet is, is, is a bear. In this. Anyway, I had never seen this before, and I'm scared to death, you know, and Bender and all. And uh, <coughs> Bender stopped the orchestra, and he says, What's the matter with the tuber there? I'd let me hear a tuber there. And I stood up, and I, well, you stood up when, you, when, he, when he talked to you. You, you. you didn't lip off at all. I stood up, and I said, Sir, I, I have 16 bars rest there. He said, The hell you do. You don't even know any Start Started letter so and he started again. The same spot, I had rest there. He says, what's the matter with the tuber? He says, they tell me you play good. Well, let's hear it. I said, sir, I have 16 bars rest, rest there. He said, the hell you do. Bring your part up here. So I brought my part up there, and he's, he's looking at the score, and he's looking at my, looking at my part. He, he says, well, you don't have it. Here's what I want you to put in there. And he, he pointed something in the score. And said, you put this in. You put that in. Play that. And so I, said, I went back and sat down. He says, well, go back and sit down. You're, well, you're better looking than your brother anyway. <laughs> that, that, that was my experience with Benter. <laughs> you know, before the rehearsal started, everybody's warming up and noodling a little. But then when he, he came into the sail loft from his office there, things got as quiet as a mouse, not a sound. And he'd come out there to, to where the podium was, on the podium, and he'd look around to the band, and he'd say that he'd say that Joe Wynn was the drum major. He'd say, "Where's the so and so?" And uh, Joe Wynn would say, "Oh, he's uh, he's on sick leave, sir." So, where's so and so? Oh, well, oh, <laughs> there was another. There was a young young kid from the school. Also, he was a fine young fiddle player. He was a little short guy. His name was O. L. Smith. He was about five feet tall. Played. And I don't think his feet even touched the floor when he's sitting. Anyway, better look back there. And, he says to the drum major, who's that midget sitting back there? <laughs> He's a character. But, well, but he, was, he, was, uh, uh, he was something. You know, uh, he, he could, uh, 
if he could he could send a man just get rid of him immediately, you know, like in fact Brash I think was just about ready to be sent to sea. Uh, just about the time that uh, well, I was still coming over to play tuba when the Japs hit Pearl Harbor there. And I can still remember Benner's speech. He came out and he says, well, boys, it looks like we're in another, you know, I wish I could do this. And it was shortly afterwards when he got caught. I don't know if you've heard that story. Somebody called the Marine captain at the gate there and said, if you stop Lieutenant Benner, he was lieutenant, on the way out and make him open his trunk, I think you might find something interesting. To this day, I'm not sure who it was that did it. I think it was Brash, maybe. But anyway, they stopped him, made him open his trunk, and he, he had about 20 gallons of navy paint in there that he was stealing. And he used to he used to make guys from the band come out and work on his, he had a farm. And, and a, one of the guys from the band, the, well, Pete Van Roon, one of the tuba players who came from Holland, and another guy, Lane Hart, played uh, baritone sax, he had them working on his farm. He, he didn't give them any choice. He said, you're, for the next 10 days, uh, you're going to be on separate duty or something. And he was working on his farm. One of them was driving a tractor. And he didn't have any choice. You do that or else. They didn't and, have any association with the band at all while they were out not, there. Not, well, not, not when he wanted them on his farm. Uh, uh, he, was, he was totally, totally the boss. There's just no, by the way, there's another story. Uh, this is, I think it's before my time, but they say it's true. The old timers, the, one of the guys in the band uh, came in with a pistol. They're going to kill him. Going to shoot him. And I think he was drunk, but they, he did have a loaded pistol with him and uh, his other buddies. I think he was a drummer. Uh, but, uh, they saw that uh, what his intentions were, and so they hustled him out of there. But uh, <laughs> he was going to shoot him. And if any guy got on his SHIT list, he, he could just hound him mercilessly. Excuse me, while I get the Japs hit Pearl Harbor, and it was shortly after when he got caught. Now, the reason they didn't, he wasn't disciplined, because after Pearl Harbor, there was terrible criticism all over the country f from Admiral Kimball and General Short getting caught with their pants down at, at Pearl Harbor. So they didn't want any more scandal, so they just... Kind of said, you just like retire that. quick. Yeah. So that's that's when uh, uh, Charles Brindler, he had a whole armful of hash marks. He'd been in there ever since the band started in 1925. As it was the Washington Navy Yard band then. Yeah. So uh, they had a uh, they had a non-musician mm -hmm. officer uh, come there just to take charge. I think for a couple of weeks or so, and then uh, they they finally made. Uh, may render the leader, but by that, by that time, I was on the Northampton over in the Pacific. <laughs> yeah, so he'd been sitting there playing clarinet? Yeah, he was a solo clarinetist all those years, sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I was in high school at home, I, the, uh, all the service bands, the Marine Band and the Navy Band and the Army Band, all had, there was no Air Force Band at that time, mm -hmm. uh, they, they all had live radio broadcasts, and I used to listen to all of them. So uh, I can still remember, you know, the, the, uh, like some of the soloists from the Navy band, Oscar Short, and uh, Louis Goucher, was playing, he was a drummer, a, a percussionist, was a fine uh, xylophone soloist and all, things like that. So I, 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 I knew about some of those things, you know. <laughs> now, was, was Herb over in the band before you? Yes, Herb, Herb was, uh, came from this, when he was in school, and he, they put it, they took him into the band, and there's a little bit, it's never been quite clear to me, but you know, Herb was bothered with asthma, very bad. And when I read his diary, after I read it, after he died, I'm, I'm amazed he lived as long as he did. But <coughs> he was always scared to death the Navy would find out, find out his, his asthma and, and give him a medical discharge. Well, anyway, one of, one of the Navy band tours, I think, I think they had him driving... Uh, Benter's car or something. In fact, for a while, Benter had a 16-cylinder Cadillac. No kidding. Yeah, 16-cylinder. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I don't know what the story was, but after a couple of years, I don't know if it was if Herb's asthma or what the hell it was, but he he left the band and, and went on. He went to the USS California. But then. So he had gone to the band from the school. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But yeah. Now this is all before the war. 
Then he went to the USS California. Now, <coughs> this was still before the war. Yeah. And he, he left the California for sure duty shortly before the Japs hit. Because California was sunk during the Pearl Harbor attack, uh -huh. uh, and he was sent to the there were he sent to the uh, naval air station at Jacksonville. There were two of them at the time. Art Creasy was in one of them, one of those bands, and Herb was in the other. Yeah. I don't know if some of the other guys that were in Herb's band were uh, Cliff Price, uh, Price. Uh, 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 Scotty Lenore, a trombone player. You remember yeah. him? Yeah. Uh, all three of them. And uh, I'm trying to think of the guy that lost all his hair. There was one guy who was just a skinhead. What did he play? Uh, wait a minute. I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, I'll think of it in a minute. Anyway, yeah, that one guy, he, he was just a skinhead, and, 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 and they say he lost all his hair overnight. He woke up in his bunk one morning, and there was hair all over. He lost it all, and that was the end of it. Okay. Yeah, what the heck was his name? Oh, gosh. Uh, Harold Fultz was in that band, too. Okay. Um, uh, the, that band leader they had in, in Jacksonville, his name was Painter, Red Painter. And he was very unpopular. In fact, he and he and, and Cliff Price had a big fight. They, he, uh, he, he, Painter challenged him. He says, come on outside, we'll settle this outside. And the band started to get up to watch it, and he said, you oh, stay there. So they went outside. And they, Painter and, and Price got in the fight. A couple of minutes later, Painter came in. He was <laughs> a bloody mess. Cliff Price beat hell out of him. And strangely enough, th this is the way I heard the story that Painter says to the boys. Here he was all bloody and disheveled. And uh, he says, boys, I've been a horse's ass. I'm sorry. And this is uh, like that. That's what he said. He apologized. <laughs> I knew Cliff Price pretty well and his wife, Jenny. Well, I, I, I had him up in Philadelphia. I know a lot of people didn't like him. I know. <laughs> yeah. A number of people, he had, he had a problem with some, some folks. Yeah, yeah. Whenever I get Sam Anzalone on here, he broke his fist on a locker at sea in Clark's band. Yeah. yeah. I never had any problem with, yeah. with Price. Well, I know a lot of people didn't like him because, uh, you know, I only knew him through Herb, you know. Yeah. I met him a few times. Well, all, that, all those guys were in that band down in Pensacola, though. That's interesting how the, the people out of that one band. Uh, well, Jacksonville, where, where that band. Jacksonville, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Red Painter was the name of that uh, yeah. leader. In fact, they said he was a very good conductor, but he was a nasty SOB. I don't know. That's what they said. I don't, who knows? I don't know. That, that's and by the way, uh, I, I believe. There was another another guy made chief. His name was Parker. I can't remember. Was a good friend of Herb's, and at one time, I guess when I was still in the school, I went to Thurman and said, uh, I asked him if I could get the the chief down there ask ask for me. I wanted it, Herb and I wanted to be together, you know. Yeah. And uh, and uh, uh, Thurman said, No, you you get some sea duty first, and then. The, and then come back and see me. Well, sure enough, after the rehearsal, after the Northampton fiasco, I did. I had, I, I was on leave in, in Minnesota off, after getting sunk. I made a special trip at my own expense to Washington to, to talk to Thurman. I wanted, to, I wanted to get sent down to Jacksonville with Herb, and he, he turned me down. And he gave me a bunch of crap, and I really blew up. I got mad. And he, he finally said, don't get hot under the collar, don't get hot under I said, I will get under the collar, what you told me, and all. you know, I, I really, I was really madder than hell at him. So to this day, I never did like him. Even when I was in the school as a kid, <coughs> I hated his rehearsals. Most of the stuff we played, I could do play it right the first time. Week after week after week after week, playing the same stuff for one concert. And I was just bored, still silly. Like I said, I played it right the first time I ever saw it. You know, I don't need to, you know, that's, so I was bored with his... You know, a lot of people swore by him, but I, I, I couldn't see him at all. You know? I remember his John L. Lewis eyebrows, as I call them, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, in front of the band up there in the in the auditorium. I, he was only there for a short yeah. while after I came into the school. Yeah, he was only yeah. a chief then when I was there too. Uh huh. Then later on, he made he made a warrant. Then he became lieutenant. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah he was. Uh, it, he did a lot of things for the program, I think. I'm sure he did. And unfortunately, this particular archive that we're working on right now 
we would have had him had to have started this five years ago. Yeah, yeah. Because he was still alive and he had a lot to contribute. Sure, you know, sure. So. Well, I think Benter had originally sent him over there to do that. You know, he was, you know, he was playing horn in the Navy band. Yeah. Well, uh, as I understand the story, uh, I, I don't know exactly what transpired for him to begin the school, but even Dutch tells me, and Tony will probably be able to. Uh, fill in a little bit of this too, but as first class, he was the person that was running the school yeah. over the yard, and uh, eventually they transferred. It must have gone from the yard to the receiving station across the river shortly after you guys left, because I understand that, that started in '41, and so I'll, that'll get cleared up well, somewhere you along know, the way. When when the Japs hit Pearl Harbor, they immediately. Started. They they installed machine guns on some of the roof the roofs of some of the buildings. They were right in the navy yard. Boy, they I mean uh, right, right away. And where the music school is now, that was they put they uh, they put up a bunch of tents over there. That was there was no music school over there then mm -hmm. across the river in Anacostia. They had there was a bunch of tents over there. And uh, I think it was while I was overseas when they finally uh, put up those buildings over there where the school is. Now I understand uh, you said that the school was where the old club is on the Navy Yard now. Or yeah, the or the old was. club, but that's where the school was, up on the yeah. third deck. Just but, that one deck. Yeah. And then but, there was an annex way up the other end of the Navy Yard there, a beat up old thing where they had to put a cake of ice in the water cooler. So you but could, now this is in 39, 40, 41. 41. Because, because it had started at a building just inside of the gate, as, as Dutch tells me. Well, maybe that's the one they call the annex. Then probably that's probably it. it that's became, possibly. Yeah. That's possibly yeah. correct. <laughs> well, this will all get this will all get worked out. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah. They they had the na the navy annex, and a lot of times when you got you still had to punch in your cards for practicing and all. Sometimes, <coughs> sometimes you had to go up there uh, to practice. Those practice cards were still in vogue when I I came in. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I remember that very very well. <laughs> yeah. You had a High scoring card, you you did pretty well. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> you had a bad card, you never went out of the gate. <laughs> That's why, don't, why don't we take a little little rest here? Okay. Okay, Lenny, we're taking a little short break here. So now uh, we covered uh, quite a bit of material, but uh, let's go back and rehash uh, some of those years in the Navy van, and. Uh, Maybe just hit on some various relationships, personalities. Uh, I know you mentioned a story about the nine old men, if you can tap on that a little bit. And uh, I know you were b big friends with Harold Brash and, and uh, any of those yeah. kinds of things there. And we'll go along here for a little bit more and I'll let you go for Okay. <laughs> well, the nine old men story came about, there came a time when uh, some of the younger men couldn't make chief because it was a quota. And uh, I guess Commander Brender decided uh, the only way to make room for him was to get rid of some of the older non-producing chiefs, which he did. He had nine of them were, were transferred. And uh, that left nine vacancies men, men that could, that could uh, make chief. Yeah, his his philosophy was, was, was a good one. The people that should be advanced were the people that were should Exactly, exactly. And there actually there should not be a quota system there in, in, in that case, you know. Yeah. And be, uh, so anyway, that's how that's how the vacancies were created. Naturally, the men who were transferred didn't, didn't take very kindly to it, but yeah. I, it's understandable, but that's what happened. That band went through a, a large, large change when we started to lose uh, all the clarinet players, which the clarinet section of the band was just absolutely spectacular. There was no band around that could touch that band as far as clarinets. And when, when they were all were gone, they all were retired or whatever, the sound of the band just changed. And it's only been just a few years ago now, and I say a few, I'm talking 12 to 15 now, uh, that we've worked back into that sound because what Gambone has got over there now, the, the average length of the people in that clarinet section around about 15, 16 years. And uh, it seems like we've recreated a, a lot of that sound. And he's, he's got a wonderful group of people. You know, since Brindler, of course, was a clarinet player himself, he, he you know, he emphasized that very, very right. much. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. That's uh, very interesting. I'm trying to think. When I came into the band, uh, the solo clarinetist was the uh, 
the clarinetist from the from the Philadelphia Orchestra, Philadelphia Symphony. I, oh, good heavens, I can't even think of his name now, but he was very well known among classical clarinetists. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, when he left, uh, he was in just during the war. When he left, uh, that's when uh, Tony Mitchell became the solo clarinetist in the band. Of course, a lot of those people, that, I mean, that band drew very heavily from the Curtis. Yes. Up there in, in Philadelphia. Ex exactly. Very, very heavily. I I can think of uh, Bill Cameron, the harpist, mm -hmm. Sal Peroni, the, the, the timpanist. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, oh, uh, I believe Buster Watkins, the horn player, came from there too. There were there were, there were a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah, there were a lot of them. And and also uh, there there were several men in the band who never would have been in in the in the navy at all except for big upheavals. And the biggest, the first one, of course, is World War One. They, rather than be drafted, they joined the Navy band. The same, same with World War II. Uh, that's, that's how I never would have joined the Navy if it hadn't been for World War II. And then, and then later on, the Korean War and so on. There were, there were a lot of men came in just be, from the, from those upheavals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a name that, that oh, I've just, ooh, gosh, I can see it. It lives down in Springfield now, too player was over there while you were there, because uh, he was a peer of mine, and I, I, I can't... The tuba player from the Navy band? Yeah. Eric Schrader? Eric Schrader. Eric Schrader. Talk to me a little bit about Eric, because Eric is going to be on here at some point in time, so yeah, well, dying down. Uh, we were always, always good friends. He uh, uh, he came, I think, from Pontiac, Michigan, and there was uh, another trumpet player uh, from that area uh, yes. in the band. Uh, uh, yeah. My memory is yeah, so I know who you're talking about. Um, uh, my memory is so bad. Because those two guys are supposed to give me a line on the clarinet player. It was in the band, the first band that I went out in. Yeah. was from Pontiac, Michigan also. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <coughs> I call the name right now. Well, talk to me about, uh, you, you were friends with Harold Brash, right? You guys were... Well, uh, uh, Harold Brash, like I said, he, uh, he was very much of a teetotaler. He wouldn't. He never smoked or drank, but he had a what I consider a very negative uh, personality. He just could not stand to see things going nice and smoothly. And I've seen it happen more than once where, at a, at a rehearsal with Brendler, things were going pretty well, and Brendler was pretty happy. And I could see he was going to say, "Okay, boys, we're going to leave early today. Go ahead." And then Brash would do something to rile him up. <laughs> Next thing you know. Brenner would say, ah, take an intermission and come back and something, you know, like that. But, uh, and I told you, as when I roomed with him, uh, I hear I am in the same uniform. I haven't said a word yet, and everybody hates me, you know, uh, hotel keepers and waitresses in the restaurants and everything. That's just the way he was. He just could not stand to see things going smoothly. Uh, he was a wonderful player. I, I've never heard a better one. Me either. <laughs> me either. Yeah. <laughs> wow, the sound is just... Sound will be with me forever. Yeah, and it's just no, no, no smoother euphonium sound. And there have been a lot of fine euphonium players, and a lot of them ended up over there in the National Concert Band of America. Yeah, in the days of Benter, not Brenner, but in the days of Benter, I think Brash came pretty close to being uh, sent to see Brent. He, he, he got on the wrong side of Benter, I think. Then, of course, when the Japs hit Pearl Harbor and, and Benter got caught with the uh, Things that he shouldn't have in the trunk of his car, <laughs> that's ended that. But he, Brash was a wonderful player, no doubt about that. Yeah, yeah. Any other folks around there? That, man, you can well, of course, I've, I was, was always very friendly with Oscar Short. I admired him so much. And uh, once in a great while, if, if I didn't like intonation or something, I'd talk to Oscar. And he would say, You do exactly what you're always doing. There's fine, you know. Uh, and what, what amazed me sometimes, on a, maybe on a concert, I thought this intonation in certain sections uh, was pretty bad. And yet, when we made recordings, it seemed to even out. I, that's a strange phenomenon, but it, it seems to happen that way. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times, of course, uh, in hot weather, the, the brass instruments mostly will, will get a little sharper than the, than the clarinets and so on. And there's, there's little things like that. So uh, uh, there, there are there are problems, but they seem to iron they seem to iron out. Now, 
for one thing, in the in the Navy band, we we never hardly ever took a tuning note, like from the clarinet or from an oboe or anybody. We, we just we just played, and without being told, we if, if tuning slides needed to, changing, we would do it without being make a big fuss about it. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean that's professional. Yeah. I, yeah. It, it, it bothers me with with not good bands. You you have to take a note, and then yeah. it gets into a teaching process, which a band that level is is not a teaching process. It's a matter of playing. Yeah. And interpretation. I do remember in the in the symphony orchestra now with all the strings, they used to have a tuning note, and they used to have John Reichmack standing by the strobe the scope strobe the con. The, Stroke, Stroke uh, on it. and yeah. checking, you know, to see whether they, they were right. But we mm -hmm. never did that in the band. Yeah, yeah. John Reachmack, well, that's another name that comes. Yeah, back. we used to call him Reachmack the Watchmack. He he, <laughs> he 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 had taken a, a watchmaking course in the years beforehand. <laughs> and, and you know, he, he originally his name started with an H, H R E A C H M A C K, <laughs> Reachmack. And then he just took, I guess, legally he took the. Uh, H off it. That was, that's very interesting. Uh, my mom uh, was a nurse, and she was a nurse for his family there for for a while, and I had an association that I didn't even yeah. know about that that came along. It's very interesting. So I, I let's see what else can we cover about that band or your time in the Navy uh, before we settle up here. I guess uh, getting back to Herb again, uh, when, when when Herb left. Uh, what was it, Jacksonville, I guess that was when he went back to the school, right? Yeah, when Herb left Jacksonville, he came back to the school. Uh -huh. And, uh, well, it was, it was mostly through my inf influence, but uh, I, I, I had gone to Commander Brenner, and uh, we had a vacancy in the two position, and I said, for heaven's sakes, let's get my brother over here. He, he's a good player and everything, and uh, so that's when he came back to the Navy band, so we were together. And then, uh, uh, actually, uh, when the band went on tour, of course, they couldn't take the whole band. The, men's that were, the men that were left behind, they called that the home guard. Well, in 1952, the year Herb died, I, I was on tour with the Navy band. We were in uh, Brookings, South Dakota. And uh, somebody, at the afternoon, we were playing at a big auditorium at a college somewhere, or, or a gymnasium might have been, I don't know. But anyway, somebody came in back of the where the troopers were sitting and handed me a note and it, it said emergency phone call so I, without making a big fuss about it I just sort of sneaked out and set the horn down and went out a back door and, and, and went into the office where there was a phone and I got a message that my brother Herb had died he he was back in the home guard in Washington so uh, I, I since we were right close to my hometown in Minnesota I, I immediately they uh, they arranged to give me leave, and I went home. And then I think they sent, uh, probably sent Shehe from Washington back to, to take my place. In fact, that tuba that I was using on that particular tour, it, it belonged to Shehe, and it had been with, to, to a guy named Ratliff, who was the tuba player on all these Spike Jones records you hear. That, in fact, he had a two-piece case on it, on that horn that said uh, Spike Jones and his city slickers on there. So that was a tuba I was I was using when I went on that tour. My own tuba was at the factory being reconditioned. So Shea said, "Why don't you take that one?" Which I did. It was a very a very good horn. It was a big Martin uh, four valve top action uh, tuba. Mm -hmm. So when Herb died and I went to Minnesota to be with my folks and then the funeral, so uh, uh, they I think they sent for Shea. He he came out and that was his tuba there anyway. <laughs> Well, that's very interesting. I, well, I cherish that tuba that I've got over the house. There, yeah, I tell you, Herb bought that tuba at the time. I think I think he bought that. I think it was 1938, mm -hmm. and uh, he was already in the Navy band then. I think, and uh, I think at the time, I think the local dealer, I think, was Jordan's Music at that time. I think, and strangely enough, he never bought a case with that horn. Uh, yeah, that's one of my dilemmas today. Yeah, it's, yeah, uh, not having a case for the horn, and I don't know that I'll ever have a case made. Tell me this, uh, how long were the two of you in the band together? You and Not very long. Well, let's see, he came back to the band probably 
maybe about 46. And of course he died in 52. So yeah. there, there you have it right there. Yeah. So well, when uh, I came in in 49 and he was already over school. So I don't yeah. know when he left the band to come over school. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he wasn't in the band very long uh, you know, when he died. Uh -huh. Of course, he, he, was only, uh, he was only 40 years old. Yeah. But, you know, he had had asthma. Yeah. I can still remember when I was littler, of course, he was eight years older, when I can remember him sitting up in bed wheezing and wheezing and trying, couldn't even get his breath with, with, that, with that asthma. And uh, you know, if he, was, he was all right until he got a cold, then he couldn't breathe. And... Uh, he uh, he tried to keep himself in shape all the time, so he didn't catch colds. So he worked out with the weights, and uh, he was ten times as strong as I was, because he was working out with the weights every every other day. I think it was. You know, you never worked two days in a row, but he worked out with the weights, and uh, uh, to, he, he he and I could wear the same clothes, but he was far stronger than me. But when he got a cold, he was in bad shape. And after reading his diary. He, when he got a, a, an attack of asthma, he, he would, he would uh, diagram it in his diary. It might last two or three days. Sometimes, sometimes he didn't have a single wink sleep for two or three days. Not, wow. not even an hour. Wow. And, and he'd write in the graph when it reached its peak and it went down and so on. Uh, but he was always afraid that uh, they were gonna, he, he, he'd get a medical discharge from the Navy for that. Well, I believe he was the one that introduced the method of teaching string bass to beginners, yes, like me, at at that point, uh, with uh, records, because he would take the bass parts off of records, and he had this tremendous collection up there in yeah. his room, and we'd come and we'd do what we had to do in the Samandel book, but the last thing would always be two or three tunes that I had to copy down. Yes. And 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 and, and learn to play pizzicato, of course, and when I come back next week, that, that's what we got to play, and we go through this, and I remember the, the Van Damme uh, group was getting pretty popular. Art Van Damme, yeah, yeah the he accordion had, player. He, yeah, yeah, he yeah. Had, he had some, some stuff out of there. I'll, I'll cherish those those days. Yeah. And, well, you know, I still have one of the books we had all these bass parts copied, but most of them I don't have the records anymore. They were mm -hmm. mostly broken and so on, you mm -hmm. know. He had, I had Dozens of them in, in bushel baskets upstairs under the eaves, and most of them got warped in the heat and everything. And uh, I, I don't have them anymore, unfortunately. I wish I did. Somewhere I've got some of that stuff around, and it's lost like a lot yeah, of things yeah. are. And also, we made a lot of rec recordings in the Navy band, uh, not commercially, but uh, the, the, they weren't done on, but they weren't permanent. And. Some of them I played so many times, I eventually just had to throw them away, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because a lot of them that I liked kind of because I was on them, and uh, I'd like to have them, but they're, they're gone now, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I've gotten into this category of collecting records and, yeah. and things like this. I guess the older you get, the stuff means more to you. Sure, absolutely. Uh, yeah. uh, there's a lot, the most of them that I want, uh, of course, are old 78s. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's one of them that I, I don't know if you remember the group of singers called the Mary Max? I do remember this name. Well, they made one recording of uh, The Way You Look Tonight. It was a, it was a wonderful, it was a, a wonderful, wonderful recording. And uh, I was asking, uh, I was asking about it. Well, one of my daughters, I guess, found it on the internet. In fact, she just sent it to me. Uh, but the tune I wanted isn't on there, they didn't, uh, the way you look tonight. But they, uh -huh. they were a good singing group. Very, very, yeah, very good. And I, but the, 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 the tune I wanted is not on here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's, that's, uh, that's good stuff. They had wonderful arrangements. You know, it was the three men and a, and a girl singer. Yeah. They were great. Yeah. There's one or two on there where, where they're joined by uh, Bing Crosby. I was never much for singers. But... Uh, a couple of the things they did, especially that old tune they did, The Way You Look Tonight, mm -hmm. uh, which is a good tune anyway. Uh, uh, it's not a tune, it's just got three or four chords either. Right, <laughs> right, like some stuff that, yeah. you, that you hear around now. Which reminds me, through, uh, another one, which used to, uh, a 
lot of people who are not good at it who could never fake right when it got to the bridge was uh, Bob Hope's theme song. Uh, uh, what's it, Bob Hope's theme song? Uh, 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 yeah. Oh, good God. <laughs> anyway. We're really good. Uh, when you get to the bridge of that, you better know what you're doing. Cause <laughs> <laughs> completely. Thanks for the memory. Thanks for the memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Thanks for the memory. Anyway, uh, it's pretty straightforward to begin with, but when you get to the bridge, I mean, it gets it gets it gets hairy if you don't know what it is. Yeah, Skylark's <laughs> another one. Skylark. That's got yeah. a, a pretty yeah, funny yeah, bridge yeah. too. Talk <coughs> to me a little bit about Big Zeke Zeddy. Arlington Zeddy. Yes. <laughs> he, uh, well, you know, of course, he played flute, flute and piccolo, and he became the uh, drum major. And uh, uh, he uh, he was kind of a stickler for uh, shoe shines and haircuts and that type of thing. That all was the time. His, that was his job. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's that's about all I can remember by him. Well, Zeke and uh, and Larry uh, Weehy yeah. used to come over to the club there where I played yeah, all the yeah. time, and uh, they would polish off whatever they were going to polish yeah. off. It was yeah. always great yeah. fun with those guys. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Of course, I I wasn't in the band long enough to, to to well, I wouldn't have been involved anyway because I wasn't in the concert band, and I you know, inherited this ceremonial band and and uh, had the Navy band Commodores, but I always heard the stories of when. Uh, you'd be on tour, and uh, this thing they they'd sing in the morning, and getting ready for the bus or something like this. Six foot two eyes are blue. Um, da, 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 da. Well, five Has anybody two, seen yeah. Zig Zeddy? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Waiting for Zig to show up. <laughs> yeah. and he would always get there somehow. Yeah, you know some of those tours were were just brutal. We had we didn't get any long jumps, and. Uh, just, they were abs I, I still remember when we played, I think, Portsmouth, Ohio. And uh, we had had a terribly long jump there, hardly any sleep. And, uh, and I think we had, we had run into traffic or something, and we, were, we, we arrived there late for the matinee. And I remember Dick Grove's mother was there for, to see the band, and of mm -hmm. course to see him. And I still remember her backstage. Uh, Giving Commander Brenda what for? She said, "I watched those." She said, "I watched those boys when they came off the bus and came walking in here." And she said, "Every one of them is a picture of exhaustion." And she was giving him hell. She said, "You, you she's telling you, you better dry shape up. Yeah, yeah. Dry, that's exactly right. You know." And, but I still remember that. She said, "Every one of them is a picture of exhaustion." And we had, we had, we had, especially there because we had gotten there late and we hadn't been even to the to hotel yet. And yeah. We didn't have time to clean up or do anything. But yeah. but she was right. Some of those some of those uh, tours were, were terrible. And I could never sleep on the bus. Mike Borg, I remember he was sitting in front of me, the one seat in front of me, and he, he head is bouncing around, hitting the side and clunking, and he's sound asleep. I wish I, how I envied him. I just could not sleep on the bus, and I couldn't read on the bus. I'd get a headache. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the way it was. <laughs> yeah. Well, all that's part of it, and, and sometimes, all... sometimes we have a we get a poker game going. We do, we put one suitcase it'd be in this narrow aisle on end, and then stick another one on top of it like a T, and that was our card table. We yeah. We play poker sometimes yeah. that way, yeah. or sometimes the the bus always had a microphone. Uh, sometimes we tell jokes over the microphone, things like, things like that. But uh, a lot of times, you know, we were out. Some of our tours were five weeks, and some of them seven. We met well, one of them uh, was nine weeks, without one single day off, and uh, uh, that that shouldn't be allowed, really. We we were just we were just uh, being put upon. That's what I felt, felt about it, you know. Well, I think that the circumstances today are probably a lot different than they I, were. I'm sure they are at yeah. that time. Yeah. Because uh, the band is much better transportation. I know the Dutch was telling the story on the on another tape that some folks will see that when the group had to go out to the cemetery, they get in the back end of an open truck yeah. and they take them out to the cemetery yeah. to to play the funeral. You know. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the program as it stands today is just 
worlds away from where it started. Yep. And that's the purpose of this archive, to just give folks a, a taste, a glimpse of, of what it is that they have come into. Some never saw a lot of the things that they yep. see on these tapes. And by the way, the first, the first tour, there were, of course there were no tours during, during World War II. The first one after World War II was 1946 tour. It was a southern tour, and uh, the booker at that time was uh, wasn't Gibb Sandifer. It was another booker, and uh, the time as it was, shortly after World War II, I guess people were kind of sick and tired of that type of thing, military and so on. So, and on, on that tour, we had a lot of. Listen, he's going to listen to you. <laughs> That's a bad mailman. Anyway, we had a, on that tour. Come here. <laughs> anyway, on that 46 tour, we had a lot of very poor crowds. So halfway through, to cut down the payroll, they sent 13 of the men back home. No yeah. And, and, uh, some of them were, were humiliated, others were glad. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I did cut down the payroll. Anyway. Deacon. That when the dean was my neighbor in, in Forest Heights, yeah, and uh, he was involved with the book in there in his latter years, I suppose, somehow. Uh, this, was, this was after you were going out of the band, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, he had a Martin tuba, and he, when he left, he just left it. I, don't, I think no one even wanted it. Uh, he didn't quiet down a minute. <laughs> He says, man, this is my daily job. Man. <laughs> bug me now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we've been going on for a pretty good length of time here, and you've given just a wealth of information, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate this and how much uh, folks uh, somewhere down the line will appreciate all this information. <laughs> well, so, we speak the same language, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> hey, yeah. Uh, hey, well, let me wrap this up and... Uh, and uh, I'll get going with somebody else along the way. I gotta tell one more thing. Sure thing. Yeah, you just, uh, we 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 often had jobs. You know, sometimes a dance band and sometimes a full band over at Saint Elizabeth's Hospital for the uh, patients. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was first in the band, sometimes we had a job like that. There was no, no, not even transportation. Joe Wynn, the drum major, had a little canvas bag, and he'd pass out bus tokens. It was up to you to get to the job on your own. With they give you the bus tokens. Can How you imagine that? with a bass or two? You know? Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, and uh, <laughs> I, I remember uh, one time we had to play in a, in a highly uh, security checked uh, area where they had they had uh, insane but criminals and boy that was guards all over the place that was very uh, <laughs> quite different that I still remember another time we were playing out outdoors and uh, there was one of the one of the inmates was uh, right behind me there was there was a table set up and he had a, a big water cooler with paper cups for water and while we were playing, he'd be standing right behind me, looking over my shoulder, looking at the music. Mm -hmm. So we finished one tune, and and when I pull up the music for the next one, I think it was, I think it was Poet and Peasant Overture, and he looked at it. He says, Poet and Peasant. He says, I've been listening to that goddamn thing for forty years. <laughs> <laughs> so he knew the, the liturgy. Yeah, yeah. He knew the liturgy. Yeah, yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I'll tell you, that's, uh, we, we've got a lot to say that, that, that people need to hear, and, uh, and, and this, this stuff will be around for a long, long time, and a lot of people will really get to appreciate the Navy musicians. There's some that don't even know that bands were aboard ship. Sure, yeah. And yeah. Uh, when, when the Navy Musicians Association meets down in, in Norfolk area now, it's, it's been my contention that we should always have uh, a band out there playing on board the Wisconsin that sits out there. We did it up in Massachusetts when we had the Navy musicians up there. Yeah. So maybe one day this will come to pass. But then again, I I just thank you a thousand percent. And, uh, well, it's been my pleasure. By the way, my oil ship, the uh, 
I think I showed you some pictures. Uh, Milo shipped the New Jersey that I'm a plank owner. It's, yeah. It's on permanent display now in, uh, in Camden. Camden, New Jersey. Yeah. I'm going up again. One of my sons who wasn't here when I went up there, he's, he's going to be here from, uh, from in, in just about two weeks or a week or so from here. He'll be a, he, he's coming from Aspen, Colorado. Yeah. And uh, we're going to go up there again. Hey, yeah. terrific. He went aboard. He went uh, at the time he was living in California, but he went aboard the New Jersey was in mothballs in Bremerton, uh -huh. and uh, there was just a guard of them. They 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 let him come on, but uh, he, he couldn't go around the ship. They just let him come aboard, and mm -hmm. that was it. So he's he's very interested. In fact, he's he's kind of a World War II buff. He knows all about that and the the Northampton and all that. <laughs> I just got a letter as we close up here. I just got a letter from uh, the Ariskany, uh, uh Association, which has not on this tape, but you already know that I was a plank owner on the Oriskany. Yeah. And they're dragging the Oriskany back down to Pensacola, and it's going to become a permanent reef, oh. diving reef. Uh oh, there I'll be Pensacola. Is that right? Oh, yeah. I'll be darned. So uh, that'll be something that my my kids can go down because they do a lot of diving. Yeah. But anyway, we'll pass this along into the archive here and. Uh, Thanks again. Oh, it's been my pleasure, really. From the United States, the Navy Band of Seattle. Des États-Unis, voici l'orchestre de la Marine de Seattle.